our keynote speaker, Richard Cho. He is the new executive director of the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. We wouldn't be here without the support of the coalition. They provide training for our staff. They help us with our legislative advocacy. They make sure we get the resources we need. And Richard, um, he has a vast experience. He was in Washington and actually was one of the leaders in uh, establishing policy for housing. Um, he's worked in New York City with um, Mayor de Blasio. And he's truly a, a rock star in the housing world. <laughs> we were so thrilled when we found out he was coming to CCEH and would be part of our, our uh, coalition here in Connecticut. Rock star, that's a new one. I mean, uh, sure. If I can live up to that, um, I should have brought a guitar or something. Uh, um, but no, thank you. I mean, I, I, uh, it's, I'm, I'm new to this uh, job here at the Connecticut Coalition on Homelessness. I'm not new to Connecticut. I've actually lived here for 10 years. Um, but this is the first job I've had uh, in the same state where I live because for the last 10 years I've been um, spending most of my time flying out of the state, uh, either to Washington or to other parts of the country. And so uh, it is very nice to actually be able to work and live in the same place. Um, <laughs> ironically, uh, my dad at one point uh, said to me, so you're, you know, you're working on ending homelessness, but it's like you're homeless yourself. Uh, it was a wake-up call. Uh, anyway, it was, it's good to be here and to be grounded and working in, in the state of Connecticut. And boy, there's so much uh, progress uh, and uh, that I've I sort of jumped into, and I feel uh, somewhat guilty about it because uh, so much of the progress that's been done in Connecticut has nothing to do with me, and now I get to just uh, step in and, and, uh, and celebrate a lot of that progress um, as well as uh, move forward. At some point, I'll probably lose the luster of being uh, someone who has a national perspective because I'll just become uh, one of the folks in Connecticut, and you know, the definition of an expert is someone who lives like 50 miles away from where you are. Uh, uh, and so um, I'll, I'll, I'll start to lose that, but um, I, I, uh, to the extent that I still have some national perspective, I can uh, provide a little bit of perspective on where uh, we are in Connecticut with respect to the rest of the country. And what I can say uh, in summary is that um, we are so far ahead of where many places are in the country today. Um, in fact, I was in Washington the last two days. Uh, I'm very honored to have been asked to serve on the VA Secretary's uh, Advisory Committee on Homeless Veterans. Uh, and part of that is because I have some expertise from my days at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, uh, where I worked for three and a half years in the Obama administration. Uh, but some of it is also because of Connecticut's uh, recognition of having ended uh, veteran homelessness uh, and wanting to learn from Connecticut's success. Uh, and this committee has the opportunity to advise the VA Secretary on how to continue to make uh, forward progress on on veterans uh, nationally. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I share that uh, to say, you know, I, I heard a little bit from other uh, representatives uh, on that committee about where they are on any veteran homelessness. And um, to say, uh, it, it reassures me that Connecticut has a lot of things going for it. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is maybe give a little bit of a past, present, and future on where we are in Connecticut on, on homelessness. Um, I've worked uh, in the field of homelessness for... Uh, about 20 years or so, uh, and I don't say that with a lot of pride because um, in some ways I think homelessness is a, you know, it's, a it's really a national embarrassment uh, that we have this in, in the wealthiest country in the world, uh, and that we've lived with it for so long. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I've worked in it long enough to know that uh, our response to homelessness in the early days isn't what it is today, uh, but I'm not, I haven't been uh, in it long enough to know that uh, or, or been around uh, uh, in the days when homelessness, uh, like we see it today, didn't exist. How many people here actually remember a day when homelessness wasn't something that you saw on a regular basis or read about in the paper, right? Okay. And how many people here uh, have, have lived their entire lives just knowing that homelessness is something that has been around? Right. So that, that's a sad state of affairs. Uh, and I have you know, two young children, uh, and it, uh, you know, I, I, I really hope that uh, someday they can look at homelessness as something they can uh, go to a museum to find out about, right? But that is not something that we have to live with. Now, I, I'm uh, a, a firm believer uh, that we can end homelessness because um, there was a day when homelessness didn't exist, and some of you actually remember that. And, that, and I don't think it means that we can go back to those days because, uh, frankly, you know, it wasn't always great, uh, right? There were people who uh, were still uh, in, in need, uh, and we kept a lot of people in institutional settings uh, where uh, we don't want to go back to those days. Um, but we can also look back on those days to realize all the missteps that we made uh, in this country. Um, we deinstitutionalized the mental health system and failed to create a community-based mental health uh, system uh, and a system of care in the community uh, with housing and services that could replace those institutions. 
Uh, we, uh, it, starting in the 80s, uh, began to disinvest in the social safety net uh, in, in significant ways that I think contributed uh, to uh, what we're still grappling with today. We also had, for the first time, uh, a, a major international conflict, and we did not invest in the kind of services to bring folks back from that conflict with the kind of services. So you, you think about those missteps and you realize, what, what can we uh, learn from that um, experience today? Now, when I started in the field of homelessness, uh, it was in the late 1990s. Uh, and at that time, the primary response, uh, in fact, maybe the, the predominant response to homelessness was really emergency shelters and transitional housing. And I joined an organization called the Corporation for Supportive Housing, which at that time, our vision was pretty modest. It's sort of laughable now, but it was to make uh, permanent supportive housing at least as viable as transitional housing uh, as a solution to homelessness. Right? Now we take for granted that supportive housing is a is a proven solution to ending homelessness, um, at least for many people with uh, severe disabilities and challenges. But at that time, uh, we were fighting against the view that uh, people could actually be housed successfully. Uh, the predominant view was that people experiencing homelessness, uh, many of them were just not houseable, uh, that they would never succeed uh, in their own housing unless we first fixed their treatment needs and problems. On the one hand, we had crisis response services, really trying to avert the immediate crisis of homelessness through shelters. Uh, and on the other hand, we had a therapeutic view of homelessness that people had to be fixed before they could actually be housed. That was the, the late 90s and early 2000s. And I think over the years, we've learned since that the solution to homelessness is not providing food or clothing. The solution to homelessness is providing people with homes. Uh, again, laughable now. Uh, in fact, The Daily Show, how many people saw this skit, The Daily Show uh, actually featured Salt Lake City as a response to homelessness, and they called it the Homeless Home. Uh, and the late Boy Setter, uh, who was a great champion for ending homelessness uh, in, in Utah, um, spoke and the interviewer asked, you know, um, what did you do with your with people experiencing homelessness? Did you hide them in some cellar somewhere? Because they're cheap. And he's like, no. He's like, we give them homes. And the, and the person in the interview is like astonished that that's about actually. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, the, the truth is that in the early days, we, we didn't think of providing homes as the solution to homelessness. And here we are now, uh, where housing first uh, is the prevailing response. Uh, and it is the underlying philosophy, uh, not only for uh, the, the, the system that we are creating in Connecticut, but also for all national homelessness policy. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the major things. The other development over the years uh, was the recognition that, um, you know, their homelessness is not all uh, one uh, type of problem, and it's a heterogeneous problem, right? It's not all, um, the, back in the day, the stereotype was a, a single adult male, Vietnam veteran, mental health substance use issues on the streets, and certainly that is a certain, uh, you know, a, a, a significant cohort of people experiencing homelessness, but uh, we also realize there's families with children. We like, realize there's people who are working, uh, some working full-time, uh, still experiencing homelessness. We now know uh, about the number of youth and young adults who are falling into homelessness, um, some of whom are uh, uh, because of, of, of poverty and, and lack of housing access, but many because of family conflict um, and because of their LGBT status and sexual identity, um, and uh, that, that's another dimension of homelessness. The second development, other than housing first, is the realization that we need a different structure to be uh, and that we have a, a range of tools. We've also learned that we can provide different types of, of assistance to people um, short-term rental systems, longer-term rental systems, uh, and in some cases just help navigating uh, the housing market um, to provide assistance. And I think having those range of tools has been a really important uh, uh, second development in our efforts. I think the third thing we've learned is that um, it's not the case that if you build it, it will just come. Right? Um, we used to think, uh, in, fact, in fact, the, the idea of ending homelessness first began, or at least became a national mantra uh, back in 2002, uh, and there was a national meeting held in Columbus, Ohio, where many of the national um, advocacy organizations, uh, Corporation for Supportive Housing, the National Alliance Dead Homelessness, convened in Columbus, Ohio, and signed something called the Compact to End Long-Term Homelessness. Anybody here heard of that? Okay. A couple of folks. The idea at the time was that we can end um, chronic homelessness uh, if we created 150,000 units of supportive housing. Now, our national inventory today is over 269,000, I think, units of supportive housing across the country. Uh, and certainly, we have not ended chronic homelessness. And I think the, the uh, again, uh, something that we take for granted today uh, in Connecticut, but we, we know, we didn't know at the time, was if you just build the housing, it's not the case that people will just come. And actually, you have to get put some work into getting the folks 
from the streets in shelters to that housing. You need to create a housing delivery system. During my time in the federal government, when I had the chance to work with then VA Secretary Eric Shinseki, first Asian American four star general, I looked up to the guy, although he's actually shorter than me, <laughs> man who fought in combat. He led uh, troops in battle. He advised uh, the White House on national security policy, and here he was leading the VA. And he said, I am committed to ending veteran homelessness. That was his um, top priority. Then he started to ask his staff at VA and the staff at HUD, how many veterans are homeless? And the answer was, we don't know. And in fact, the VA would say, we think it's this number, and HUD would say, we think it's this number. And he says, why do you have different numbers? And he says, because we have different definitions of veteran. Here's a guy who's developing, you know, who's used to developing battle plans, and it's all about intelligence and information that you use to do that, right? And he says, how do I solve a problem that I can't see? I don't know how big this problem is, we have no idea. And that kicked off a, a, a major effort to, to try to really uh, get to better data on this. Uh, and so I think the fourth development uh, that we've learned of what's really critical is that you need to uh, be able to quantify a problem. Uh, you can't solve a problem unless you know how big it is and whether you're actually making progress and whether that number is going up or down. Uh, and the only way that we've been able to do that, I think, is through something called the binding list. Uh, is actually having a binding list of people who are experiencing homelessness on any given day and where we can actually know uh, not only uh, who's currently homeless, but who's accountable for housing that person through what intervention and, and in what time frame. Uh, and that, that ability to have that data, I think, has been really critical uh, in our ability to uh, make progress on veteran homelessness, not only here in Connecticut, but across the country. Um, but amazingly, we've now done this for all homeless populations in Connecticut, where on any given day, we can tell you, we know how many people are experiencing homelessness, uh, how many people are being housed, how many new people are falling into homelessness, how quickly we're able to house them. And it's those four measures that enable us to know uh, exactly how, how hard to push uh, and in what really ways. Again, that took 20 years to figure out that it's housing first, uh, that it's you know, um, having a range of different kinds of tools and interventions tailored to people's needs. Uh, it's having uh, a, a system to actually deliver housing, coordinated entry systems, uh, and, and data uh, and uh, binding lists and accountability uh, that enables us to, to achieve an end to homelessness. And that's exactly what Connecticut has built. Uh, we now have a coordinated entry system that is the envy of a lot of states across the country. I don't think there's a single other state in the country that has a statewide coordinated entry system. Uh, I was uh, able to brag uh, yesterday in Washington uh, to uh, the other members of the committee that in Connecticut, uh, uh, years ago, if you were homeless, you had no idea how to get help. You would have to navigate a maze of different kinds of programs. You often had to call 20 uh, or 30 different organizations you may be on 20 or 30 different waiting lists, and if you actually got uh, uh, the lottery ticket and got housed by one of those programs, the other 19 programs had no idea that you were actually housed. Uh, it, was, it was really, frankly, a nightmare right, for people experiencing homelessness. Today, uh, maybe the system's not perfect, but at least we have a central place to go. If someone is experiencing housing crisis in Connecticut, they know exactly where to go. They can call 211. First, we'll determine what the housing needs are and has the capacity to try to resolve that uh, early on. Uh, or we'll refer them to one of our seven coordinated access networks, including uh, the MMW can here, uh, here uh, who will then um, uh, conduct uh, an assessment uh, and then provide the different types of housing assistance. And that system, uh, other than being uh, the envy of other, other states and communities, um, is really working. The annual um, numbers of enter emergency shelters and transitional housing in the state is one of the measures that we use to, to determine, are we making progress statewide in any homelessness? And what we found was another 10% decrease in the number of uh, individuals and families who used emergency shelters and transitional housing in the state. That's a 40% decrease uh, since 2012. I'm a big data geek. I want to look at why, what can we attribute this to? So we looked at this, and I looked at um, the number of people who've called 211 experiencing some kind of housing crisis. And that number went from, in the last three years, somewhere in the 80,000 range to uh, somewhere in the 70,000 range, and it's been staying steady in the 70,000, 68 so, or so thousand uh, calls every, uh, every year. Um, and that's remained stable, right? So it's not that fewer people are experiencing some kind of housing crisis. Second, the number of, uh, you know, 2 and one does their high-level diversion, tries to find out if they can provide financial assistance or if they can connect them to other services, uh, and they only, and they only uh, uh, refer them to a coordinated access network in, in really urgent cases. And we looked at that number, how many people were referred to the CANS for an appointment, uh, also um, remained steady over the last three years. The number of people who show up, right, not everybody who gets an appointment shows up for an appointment, that number has also remained steady. 
Um, and so uh, it's not that fewer people are actually uh, in need of housing assistance or homeless assistance, uh, that, that's certainly not the change. So we then looked at how many people have been housed um, through permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing in our state through the, those two major interventions. And again, that number has remained fairly steady over the last three years as well. Um, I wish I had those in front of me. Um, but uh, I can tell you what those numbers are. But, uh, um, but that number has remained steady as well. So we're doing a good job. We're housing a lot of people who you know, uh, have not been able to be diverted or prevented from homelessness. Um, so what can we attribute this to? It's really through our diversion efforts. Um, and I, I think it's through the diversions that the CANs are doing um, through um, some front-end uh, immediate financial assistance. Uh, in fact, that number has uh, increased uh, from 2016 to 2017 by 40 percent, the number of people uh, diverted from uh, the homeless system. Uh, and, um, uh, and from 2017 to 2018, went up by 70%. So now 4,000 or so households were diverted uh, from shelters and transitional housing. But to me, that uh, indicates that we now have a system that not only is able to help people who are in the most urgent situations to find uh, and obtain housing through interventions like supportive housing and rapid rehousing, uh, but we also have the ability now to distinguish cases of people who are in housing crisis from people who are in dire uh, needs and who are experiencing homelessness. That's something that I don't think we even realized we could do when we created the CAN system in Connecticut, is that we can actually um, stave off homelessness to some extent. Uh, and that, that's, uh, in, I think, um, another uh, really exciting development, uh, because it means that we now uh, can envision what it means to end homelessness. And we've talked about what does it mean to end homelessness, right? What are the three words? Rare, brief, and non-recurring, right? We want to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. Uh, that's what we've done for veterans, we want to do that for all populations. But what does that actually physically look like? And to me, what that looks like is, is a housing crisis resolution system. Uh, it's a, a, a system where we can identify anybody experiencing a housing crisis before they fall into homelessness, and where we can prevent that whenever possible, and for those that where we can't prevent it, we can actually uh, help them. That's what we are building in Connecticut today is a, um, a, a, a system that can uh, identify people uh, experiencing a housing crisis uh, and where we can actually try to help them resolve that housing crisis as quickly as possible. So if you think uh, a little bit, let's think a little bit uh, into the future, just a few years into the future, we can imagine a day when people, you know, our, our shelter system is vastly smaller than it is today. We have no, uh, nobody sleeping or living on the streets and where we can actually, um, through our 2 one system, connect people at the point of housing crisis to the kind of um, help that they need uh, so that they don't have to fall into homelessness in the first place. And, you know, uh, a few people will fall through the cracks, and so we still need to have the crisis services for them, and we still need to have interventions like rapid rehousing and permanent support housing and others uh, to be able to uh, assist those individuals. But l let's, let's see if, uh, how far we can push this idea of having a, a, a very responsive uh, crisis response system for, for housing needs. Um, and I think that's what uh, an anti-homelessness looks like. And you know, we can we can almost kind of taste it now. Right? We can almost touch it. We can almost like say that we're we're on the verge of having being able to create that uh, in Connecticut. Uh, and so it's a very exciting time for me to be here uh, to be able to show the rest of the country what does it actually mean to end homelessness. We can actually create that uh, and, uh, and and show you physically what that looks like. Uh, now we have a lot more uh, work ahead of us. Um, there are still too many people experiencing homelessness uh, on any given day in Connecticut. Right now, on the by name list, there's about 2,000 households that comprise of individuals, youth, and families. Um, and we are housing about uh, 200 or so um, households per month um, uh, statewide. Uh, but another 200 are falling into our um, homeless, uh, in, uh, into homelessness uh, such that they can't be diverted. And um, to me, that means um, our number is going to remain flat, right? Simple arithmetic. If, if the same number of people leave homelessness as come into homelessness, the number will never go down. Uh, but we have the ability to actually, um, with um, adequate resources, to really bend the curve further. Uh, and we've uh, now been able to do some projections to figure out uh, what is it that exactly we need in terms of um, housing interventions and resources to be able to bend the curve. Uh, and I can tell you, it is not billions of dollars, it's not some pie in the sky amount. It is actually some incremental um, additional amount of resources that we need uh, to end homelessness. Some of which we can actually get through just re, uh, reprogramming some of the dollars that we have in the state today. Um, so I, I say that to, to really say that it's not a question of whether we'll end homelessness in Connecticut, it's a question of when. Right? And uh, to me, it's a question of political will. Uh, do we have the political will to say that we don't want homelessness to persist uh, for another 10 years, or another 20 years, 
but that we can actually end it in, uh, in, in the near term, in the, near, in the next couple of years. That's what we can bring to some of our policymakers. Um, we, we still need to do more to house the folks who have not been diverted from homelessness, but, um, and, and again, we need those resources. Uh, we need uh, more rapid rehousing dollars. Um, we need to ensure that we're using our permanent supportive housing for those who have the highest needs. Uh, in addition, uh, what I found is that uh, there are many people experiencing homelessness who uh, a short-term rental assistance, uh, three months or so rental assistance, may be not enough, but they also might not need permanent supportive housing and long-term case management, but they need something in between. Right? One of the uh, efforts that we'll be undertaking is to engage the housing authorities that we have across our state to say that we know that you have many affordable housing resources, and, and while you have competing priorities of, of people who are seeking those housing resources and talking about Section 8 housing choice vouchers and public housing units, like if we can get some subset of those, maybe one out of five out of every turnover units or vouchers, uh, go to people who are referred by the CAMS, um, that could actually fill a huge gap in our continuum uh, of, 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 of interventions. Um, for, again, for those households who you know, need more time to be able to gain the income to afford housing in the private market, uh, but who may not need long-term case management because they don't have disabilities um, or, or challenges with um, activities of daily living. Um, second, um, we need to continue to do more on the front end. Again, as I mentioned, um, we're seeing a lot of progress being made through our shelter diversion efforts and through our front end um, interventions. And we're creating a whole range of tools, and uh, I'm sort of astonished at the fact that we, we always keep, seem to come up with new fancy names for these interventions, rapid exit, one-time assistance. Uh, to me, it's all just, you know, help, right, financial help, but the more we can invest on the front end uh, to help people avert their uh, and uh, address their housing crisis as early on as possible, um, I think we can make a lot of progress. So that we reserve shelter for only people who need it the most, and we reserve um, our uh, rapid rehousing, permanent support housing, and, and vouchers and services for the, those who need it the most, um, but really try to do as much uh, prevention as possible. Um, second, uh, uh, for the last several years, uh, a, much, a, a big part of our focus has been on um, helping people uh, who have the longest term um, shelter use and, and homelessness um, get act priority access for our services. And I wonder now if we're at a point uh, in Connecticut where we can rethink some of that. Because now we're down to smaller numbers and essentially what we're doing uh, is uh, have created a system in which um, people now have to wait to become long-term homeless in order to get assistance. Uh, and I think we have the ability now to, through our coordinated access networks, to be able to identify who needs what type of intervention um, sooner. And so maybe we need to move away from this idea of targeting the longest-term shelter users for assistance, but provide assistance immediately. Why wait for people to have to hit 365 days of shelter use uh, in order to provide housing for them? making this question about who has a disability in the homeless system, uh, you know, this, this mystery, right? It's, it's scrambling around to find medical documentation and paperwork. Um, we have the ability to match our data with state Medicaid data, state mental health and uh, substance use data to, to pinpoint who has a disability in our system, uh, create a flag in, in our data system, in HMIS, so that um, people with disabilities can get housed immediately for permanent support housing, and we can provide rapid rehousing and other interventions to people who don't have a disability and not wait for them to become long-term homeless. We have more work to do uh, to really retool the way that we have been providing uh, assistance. Um, there's been great uh, change underway within shelters and within our frontline um, staff to really focus on how to help uh, people um, move out of uh, a shelter, not make shelter a permanent destination, but something that uh, is a way station on the way to permanent housing. Shelter staff are undergoing culture change to really learn how to become uh, people who encourage and motivate people to move out into housing. And I think where we need to move is uh, to really finish the job of operationalizing that, that problem-solving philosophy, uh, that philosophy of, of helping people move on uh, and really institutionalize the idea of motivational interviewing and uh, encouragement uh, and really focus on uh, helping people connect to housing immediately um, so people don't get uh, too comfortable. Um, and it's human nature to settle, right, wherever you are. And I think the longer we let people stay in shelters, the more people will become settled there. I think we need to, from day one, when people enter shelters, talk about housing, where are you going to be going, uh, what is the housing that you want, and help them envision, help them um, find that hope again. And, and we know people experiencing homelessness are in a state of crisis, in a state of survival mode, um, but uh, it is a part of our job as the homeless response system to figure out how do we tap into that uh, inherent um, hope that, that may be buried beneath the years and years of trauma. Uh, but really to find that hope again, uh, to build on, on their strength and resiliency.
It's like a kid in a candy store with all the data that we have. Um, and uh, some of you know I keep um, you know, making a new chart every day uh, to really look at uh, different ways that we can use our data. Uh, use our data to push our performance in ways that we never were able to do before. Uh, for example, we could say uh, how much more outflow, how many more people do we need to house in order to bend uh, the curve on homelessness? Um, how much more uh, diversion do we need to do to, to, to reduce the inflow? The median time on the buying list is about 130 something days, right? So people basically who end up in shelter um, stick around for four months or more um, waiting for housing assistance. That's unacceptable, right? We need to get that down to 90 days or less. We need to get that down to potentially 60 days. I would love to work towards a day when uh, nobody has to remain in shelter longer than 30 days and can, can move into housing. Um, that's the kind of um, aspirational goals that we can, we can set for ourselves. We have a lot more to do on youth, um, and I'm excited about the fact that we have, uh, it's amazing with uh, young adults who were largely an ignored population um, many years ago. Uh, we're going from zero to 60 uh, right, really, really fast. Uh, we um, have taken everything that we've learned on veterans and for families and individuals, and we're applying those to youth, but also, in many ways, uh, avoiding the missteps that we've made uh, in creating those systems for, uh, for individuals and families uh, and creating a system that's really responsive to youth and young adults. It's amazing the kind of partnerships that we've been able to create in different uh, you know, agencies, sectors, uh, and uh, non-traditional partners have come out of actually the system in the effort to not only count and outreach to young adults experiencing homelessness, but to help us uh, create a system that's responsive to them. The six and a half million dollar um, Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program Award is, is really game-changing for us. Um, it be able to build I have a soft spot for our federal partners, and uh, you know it is amazing how hard uh, our, our federal um, officials work um, on on ending homelessness every day. And I you know, haven't been to you know, Washington and had conversations with um, VA staff as well as staff within HUD and USICH uh, and the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education at the staff level. Um, the priorities of leadership may have may have shifted somewhat, but the st the staff and the, the Lower level leadership within those agencies, they have not taken their foot off the pedal. Um, they're continuing to work hard on ending homelessness. By the way, I want to say, um, when I look out in this crowd, I just feel this uh, overwhelming sense of optimism um, for our state because um, really none of this system that we've created would have been possible. None of the progress that we've made would have been possible without the collaboration that we have in Connecticut. Um, we're building a system out of uh, a set of autonomous organizations and individuals who don't work under some kind of bureaucratic um, hierarchical structure, right? You're here because you're here voluntarily and here because you believe in the system. Uh, so it's a system that's held together purely by your goodwill uh, and your, your commitment. Uh, so I want to thank you for all of that. Uh, and again, uh, for, for giving me the optimism. So when I look out here, I see the kind of collaboration, uh, not only here in Middletown, but um, also throughout the state. Uh, and again, I think also throughout the country that is working to drive an end to homelessness. So thank you very much for all your work.